So we're going to start off, um, yeah, we, we've been doing the Growing in God series, which has been all about your growth and how you can grow as a believer. Okay, and this is the last part of it this morning and this evening, and it's all focused around how you can make a difference. And the point is, is that as believers, as humans, I think it's, we're all wired to want to make a difference. You know, I, I think if you are in a place where you kind of don't care and you don't want to make a difference, it's probably because there's something wrong with you. It, I'm being dead serious. Like it, it's probably because there's been a hurt or, or something's gone wrong and so you're resistant to wanting to sow into people's lives and invest and, and all of that. But I think we're wired for it. Okay? And, and so we, we went from find freedom and we spoke about how when we know Christ, we, we come to find freedom. And then we moved on to the next week, which was the importance of church family and how if we're connected into the, you know, you can't fulfill your destiny without being connected into church family. We focused on uh, the, uh, like the benefits of being part of a, a good local church. And then last week, we looked at the spiritual gifts and their purpose. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, uh, you know, we're looking at how God's put gifts inside of us, and the gifts inside of us are for us to be able to give to other people, to be a blessing to other people. And uh, you know, over the past week and a bit, I even discovered, I mean, I've been operating in certain gifts for a while, but I even discovered some of my gifts through that preparation time and, and spending time with the Lord thinking about gifts. And I was like, that's awesome. And you know what I realized is those gifts, the whole purpose of them is for me to, to give them to you. So, like for example, you know, uh, 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 let me know if I can get into example. I'm going to get into the message, otherwise I won't come back. So it's really, uh, um, that was really exciting. And now we're going on to make a difference. And I'm going to start off in 2 Corinthians 5.20. 2 Corinthians 5.20. I'm reading from the New King James. You've got the King James up there. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we looked at this this morning, and we looked at that uh, an ambassador is someone who represents someone else, and we looked at a whole bunch of detail around that, but the basics of it is that we don't represent ourselves, we represent Jesus. Amen? And so, you know, as a representative of uh, Jesus, of God, we don't have the authority to have our own message. We've got to give His message. You never heard the ambassador of America uh, you know, coming to, the, uh, to South Africa and telling South Africa how bad the president of America is. Or, you know, saying an opposite message to where he's coming from. He does, he's not entitled to his opinion. I think that's a big one. As an ambassador of Christ, you're not, you, you can have your own opinion, but you're not entitled to share it. You have to share the message that you're sent to, to share. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a bit more detail now. But uh, look with me at 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. So 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Okay, so if you want to know what's good and acceptable, look at this. Verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, you know, God's heart for, for, for the world is that everyone come to, how does it put it there specifically? All men be saved and all men come unto the knowledge of the truth. <laughs> so there's two parts there. He wants everyone to become a, a, a child of God, everyone to be born again. And then God's desire is that everyone come to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth through who Jesus is, who God is, who you are in Christ, your identity in Christ, the truth of the word, the truth of the gospel. Because there's a lot of Christians who don't believe the right stuff. So this, is, this kind of sets our mandate then as ambassadors of Christ. Firstly... If you want to be a good ambassador, what do you need to do? You need to know who's sending you because you can't represent someone you don't know properly. So you need to know who, who's sending you. You've got to know his true character. We looked at that this morning. You know, a lot of people misrepresent God and act harsh and mean and cruel and unforgiving. And that's because they don't know God. You're going around pointing out people's sins. You don't know God. If you're going around and, and you're, you're lifting people up and showing, telling them how forgiven they are in Christ, and you, you, you probably know God. Okay? But you know, God's will is that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So God's will for you is that you come to the knowledge of the truth. You grow in the knowledge of the, of the truth as well. So that you can start to, to be an effective ambassador. Because that's you know, an ambassador of Christ, an effective ambassador of Christ is someone who knows the truth. You've got to know the message that you're sent to give. You've got to know who's sending you. You've got to represent Him well. Okay? 
And we focused on that a lot this morning, so I don't want to get in that, into that too much. But you know, an ambassador, as an ambassador, I mean, this is, this is the part of our commission. Okay, So um, John twenty twenty one says, As the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's what Jesus said. So he was sent by God to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. Now you see Jesus saying, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. What is the motivation of God sending Jesus? Love. And so for God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. For, God, for, 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 for Jesus so loved the world, he sent us. So now we've got to realize that our motivation for wanting all men to be saved and all men to come to the knowledge of the truth is love. It's not, if we don't get so many people into heaven, you know, your, your, your position is in jeopardy, as some cults believe. You know, you've got to get so, you know, the, the people with the most converts win <laughs> your, your seat in heaven. It's not like that. There's enough space. There's no, there's no shortage of space in heaven. And you don't have to perform to, to, to get there. All you need to do is believe and receive. Mark 16, verse 17 says, In my name... You will cast out demons and it carries on. Talk about in his authority, this is what we're going to do, which means that you're a representative of Jesus and this is what you're ordained or created or commissioned to do. And it's supernatural stuff. John 14 verse 12, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the, the works that I do, he shall also do. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. That's all saying that Jesus has commissioned us to go as he went and to do what he did to be his representative. So you can ask yourself in any situation, what would Jesus do? And it would be a case of, well, that's what you should do because you're his representative. You are where he wants to be. (laughs) So in your workplace, in your home, in your your neighborhood, as you're going to the shop or whatever, it's like whatever Jesus would do is what you're commissioned to do. And you, there's no pressure. You don't have to do it. We spoke about that this morning. As you experience His love and His goodness, it should well up within you and you want to do it. You want to reach out to people. Don't let it be a burden on you. If you're at the place where I don't really want to tell anyone about Jesus, I've been there. That's fine. Take the pressure off of you. Just focus on Jesus. Focus on His love for you. Allow yourself to grow in understanding and experiencing His love. And you know what? Things will start to happen. It will be effortless. Amen? So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As they God did beseech you by us. God is reaching out to you through us. We pray in Christ did be reconciled to God. I love this passage in 2 Corinthians 5. It starts off by saying verse, what's it, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Okay, so it's talking to us as believers. It's not talking to me as a pastor. It's talking to all of us if you're a believer. It's saying that if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You know what's awesome about that? Is your pastor, your pastor has got nothing to do with you anymore. I really believe this is, this is a word for someone this evening. You're holding on to your past. You need to let it go because God's already let it go. You know, Hebrews 10, 17, one of my favorite scriptures. God speaking, their sin and iniquity I'll remember no more. God's forgotten it. Who are you to remember it? Move on. Okay, so if you look at it, it's saying you're an ambassador. It says uh, you're a new creation, and then it goes down and it mentions a couple of things. It says you've been given the ministry of reconciliation. You've got the word of reconciliation. And then in verse 19, if you go up one, it says uh, what that word of reconciliation is. And it says that God was, reconciling, was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So it's not that you reached out to God. This is the message which we have, which we, be sharing, which we should be sharing with people. It's not that you reached out for God, to God and you tried to do something uh, for Him. He reached out to you through, through Christ. He made the first move. He didn't wait until there was enough sacrifices to send Jesus. There wouldn't have been enough sacrifices. Okay, He didn't wait until it was desperate enough. Okay, and then it says, not imputing their trespasses unto them. What does that mean? It means that He wasn't holding the world's sin against them. Now, the, This is a good ambassador versus a bad ambassador. A good ambassador, as we've said, focuses on the right message. This is the message, go and do it. A bad ambassador would 
So you have the, the commissioning from God saying, this is my message, go for it, and they go and botch it up and do whatever they want. They say what they think. They share their opinion. You know what our message is not? Our message is not turn or burn. Our message is not, it, it, there's a, elements of truth in all of that. That's why it works. But it's, it, it, our, our message is not, um, you know, God's really angry at your sin. Our message is not, guys, it, it, it's, it's the last hour for us. <laughs> it's not, uh, hey, we need, to, we need to pick up our socks. We need to turn. We need to get praying as a nation because things are really bad. God, you know, this is our last opportunity. That's not true. It might be a, a, an opportunity before things go really bad, but at the same time, hey, our message isn't that. Our message is, hey, God's not holding your sin against you. Do you know what that does? It pulls all the pressure off of the individual, and they'll want to receive God. But as long as they think that they have to fast, pray, jump through hoops in order to please God, they're not going to want to come to God. Who wants to come to someone who has this huge expectation on them to be perfect? God doesn't expect people to be perfect, and so he, it's, it's prepaid. He's already forgiven them. So you're not saying, hey, you need, to, you need to ask God to forgive you of your sins. What sin? God's dealt with them in Jesus. <laughs> and here you're very excited about it. So not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This is the word of reconciliation. God has reached out to you and forgiven you. So I mean, you go to unbeliever, you don't have to say, hey guys, you know, you're drinking, you're sleeping around, you're whatever you're doing is really, really bad. And it's just going to cause destruction in your life. There's some truth in that. And you know what? God's really angry with you. There's no truth in that at all. And you're like, you know, if you don't, if you don't repent, God's going to really just write you off eventually. There's no truth in that. You want God's blessing on your life, you have to get rid of the sin in your life. No truth in that. He's already blessed you, Ephesians 1 verse 3, and He's already forgiven you of your, your, your stupid sin, because it's stupid, we can all agree, but all you need to do is receive. You don't have to beg for it. And as an ambassador of Christ, a good ambassador, come, look, verse 20, if you go down, that's verse 19, what comes after 19? 20. So it's amazing how things follow in order, hey? If you read verse 19, it speaks about God not holding anything against you. Verse 20 speaks about how you're an ambassador of Christ. If you want to be a good ambassador, get to know the message and, and, and get to share it properly. Don't go and tell people that they need to, to deal with the sins of their forefathers. God dealt with those sins. It's true. Okay? That's not my purpose for this evening, but... Have the correct message is what I wanted to share with you because you're an influencer and so you want to influence people positively. Okay, but as an ambassador, let, let's be honest, you don't always have the opportunity or the open door to share with people, right? You, you may not have experienced this, but you don't always have the opportunity to, to be able to share the gospel with people because maybe you've burnt the bridge. It's not a nice place to say amen, but I can hear you saying amen. Maybe you've burnt the bridge, the person's close to you, or you just, it's distance. That, that kind of prevents you from ministering to the individual. You know, in that kind of, in that situation, what do you do? The only thing you can do is pray. And as an ambassador of Christ, that's one of the key things that we can do for believers, um, for unbelievers, is pray for them. So I want to just share, I don't know when I've last shared this, but I don't think I've shared it for a while. Just share on how to pray for, for the lost. Because the point is, is that a lot of people do it completely wrong. You might be completely sincere about it. You might enjoy your prayer time. But if it's wrong, it's wrong. Amen? And what do I mean by wrong? Well, begging God to save someone is wrong. Why? Because He loves them more than you love them. And you sound like you're probably trying to convince God that that person's worth saving. He, he's already done everything that He can do to save that individual. And every single person on the face of the world. And so, I mean, it doesn't matter how much you love your unsaved loved one, God loves them more. Can we agree on that? And so if He loves them more, are you sh I'm pretty sure He's done more than you could do to try and get them saved. Not only did He send Jesus, not only did He, he provide the, the eternal life free of charge, you just have to receive it. We spoke about that this morning. So no pressure gospel. Not only did He, he give the free gift of eternal life, what else did He do? He sent the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit's doing? He's not preaching the gospel to people. That's your job. That's my job. The angels aren't even allowed to preach the gospel. 
That's your job. That's my job. It's our privilege. What is the Holy Spirit doing? He's ministering to people's hearts. He's revealing Jesus to them. I mean, you can read it in Acts. I wish I had gotten there. But in Acts, if you go read it, you know, the Holy Spirit's working in, in, a believer, in an unbeliever's heart. He says, you need to go here. So he goes there. And, and, and then what is it? You know, Peter or Paul or whoever, they're all getting together. And it's like the Holy Spirit's working between people to get the gospel preached. You know, the, the, the Holy Spirit um, uh, uh, um, gives uh, Paul a vision and it's come over to Macedonia to help us here, preach the gospel to us. Why didn't the Holy Spirit just do it? Why didn't the angels just do it? Because it's not their duty. It's not their responsibility. It's not their privilege. It's, it's, it's ours. And if you'll listen, God will, will lead you. God will show you where you need to be and who you need to impact because it's all about making a difference. And you know, let me just say this as well. I mean, if it's not about reaching people and, and, and helping them in their eternities, then what, what could it be about? Because I, I, I know a lot of people, I've engaged with a lot of people, and that's like, well, you know, my, my thing is just to help them with their, their needs for now. Like, you know, they, they, they need a good job, so I'll provide a job, and then they need to learn how to manage their money, so I'm going to help them learn to manage their money, going to help them to build a house, going to manage, you know, whatever, all of that stuff. That's great. And if you're doing that, keep doing it. But if you do that and you never preach the gospel, you're wrong. Because the gospel is more important than that. that all that stuff's going to burn. One day it will not exist. <laughs> Eternity is forever. Hell is very hot. There's pressure there in the sense of, you know, we, we, we mustn't play games. So, you know, let's look at how to pray for the lost. <laughs> Firstly, you know, God's done everything that He can do to bring people to salvation, and He's not withholding salvation from anyone. Let me just uh, get there and say John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that whosoever believes, not a selected few, but whosoever believes, whosoever means anyone, except maybe no, no one, except no one. And so there isn't a few, a few people who are called to be saved and a few people who are not called to be saved. Everyone is, is called to be saved. God wills that none perish but all come to repentance. Okay, Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so God has... has presented His salvation to everyone. It's available for everyone. Like I said, you know, whosoever believes, John 3, 16, that shows that the gospel is not difficult. Salvation isn't difficult. It's not complicated. We make it complicated. You know, we, we kind of make it simple in the beginning. Hey, come to Jesus, receive. It's going to be awesome. And then they're kind of there. And then as soon as they're saved, you know what some people do? Fill in this 10-page document on everything you've ever been involved in, and we're going to start renouncing everything. I had that done. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it, it becomes complicated. The gospel's simple. If it sounds complicated, it's wrong. And I'll be bold enough to say that that's completely wrong. Why do I, how do I know that? Look with me at Colossians. Someone here needs to hear this then, because this is in my notes. Colossians chapter 1. And I know people experience uh, some uh, fruitfulness in, in, in things like that. And the reason for it is because they're believing for it. But you can experience fruitfulness like that and even better without going the route of crazy. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and, translate, and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son? So it's speaking of Jesus, right? And it says, who has. What tense is that in? The past tense. So it means it's happened. Speaking about Jesus, meaning what He's done for us. Okay? I used to believe in all that junk <laughs> that I'm knocking now. And when it was difficult for me to receive this. But when I was confronted with this and I saw it in Scripture, I had choice. Do I go with what, I, what I've been brought up in? And what I've, I've experienced, or do I, I accept what the Bible says? And so you accept what the Bible says, or you accept what you, your, your upbringing believe, uh, says. Who has delivered, past tense. Jesus has already set every single Christian free. The moment you receive Christ, you're free. Okay, you might not be free. You might not feel free. You might be in some kind of bondage. There's no condemnation on you. But the, 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 cell, the jail cells open. 
All you need to do is walk out. It's much easier. Sin is dead. Sin is dead. Go read Romans 6, 7, and 8. Sin is dead. It's not a force in your life anymore. It's only a power because you're making it a power. Sin is dead. It's completely dead. (laughs) You're letting a corpse wreck your life. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Whatever power you think darkness has, it's nothing. (laughs) Nothing. You know, when we were in Albania and and, and we were getting ready to do a a meeting the next day and, you know, to minister to people and see, I mean, you know, it's, it's a Muslim culture. So we're getting ready to, to, to kind of go and, and, and you know, reach, reach people. And I can't remember. I think we had, I don't remember how many salvations and baptisms, but it was awesome. We were, un, we were constantly having attacks and, and, and health with the boys and with myself and Marna and the, the whole team, Alicia and Carl. And you know what I, I taught William to say? The devil is a moron. I taught him to say that. Whenever we prayed for him and, 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 and ministered to him when, it was, when he was coughing or, you know, whatever. I can't even remember anything about the, 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 the sicknesses. But, but you know, he, he learned that the devil's a moron and God is good. And many people like freak out, you know, you need to respect the devil. Why? Jesus on the cross didn't respect the devil. He smashed him. He defeated him. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. Now we can just push him over because he's, he's a pushover. Anyway. Who has delivered, past tense, us from the power of darkness and has, past tense, translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. So this is all past tense referring to an incident, something that happened. What is it? It's your salvation. The moment you receive Christ, you become a new creation, you've been delivered from the power of darkness, and you've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of Jesus. That's exciting, even though you don't sound excited. So now you're placed in this kingdom of, da- of light, the kingdom of Jesus, and you're completely and utterly free. But you might be experiencing some uh, negative things, and it's just because you have a knowledge problem. You're not possessed. You might be oppressed, or whatever you want to call it. The, the root word for all of that is demonized. You're having demons trying to afflict you doesn't mean they're controlling you, believer. It just means they're playing with you. And you know what Jesus said? You shall be delivered and the deliverance shall make you free. Everyone knows that scripture. You shall know the truth. Jesus said, your word is truth. So you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. When you come to know the truth, the more truth you come to know, the more freedom you'll experience. You don't need to go for deliverance again. Deliverance, I've done deliverance on people. We had one guy. He <laughs> we had one guy who came, you know, and, and he, was, uh, he came and sat in my office and he had done Bible school and a whole bunch of things. And he sat down there and he looked at me and he said, Shane, I've had enough of this Christian thing. And he's done Bible school. I'm, I'm, I looked at him and I started laughing. I said, say that again. And he said, you know, I've had enough of this, this Christian thing. It's too difficult. And I said, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and then he said, no, I'm just, I've had enough, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm done with it. I said, I know that, I, I used his name and I said, I know that that's not you talking. And he said, no, what are you doing now, Shane? I said, I know that that's not you talking. I said, devil, I can hear you talking. I said, this isn't how this guy talks. And he said, no, Shane, don't say that. Just, just stop it now. Just, just accept my, and I was like, now you've overplayed your hand. And I said, Shut up and come out. And the guy started screaming and running around the house. Our maid was there. Her eyes were this big. It was very funny. And I had a glass of water. And I was like, okay, Lord, what should I do now? (laughs) He's running around screaming. It happens, things like that. What happened? I I, I put out my arm like this when he ran down the passage. (laughs) Hit his chest and he went on the floor. I drug him into my office. Just telling you what happened. You want deliverance? You can come visit me. So I pulled him into my office. And what did I do? I said to him, I I, I just commanded the thing to shut up and get out, and he was fine. His eyes opened up, he looked at me, and he said, what am I doing here? How come I'm here? He said, I'm just showing you that this stuff happens, and this is in the recent days or years. So he's like, what happened? Why am I wearing these clothes? I've got two different shoes on. And he's like, "Uh, I'm confused. I said, everything's fine, don't worry. I said, let's have a cup of tea, and I'll tell you the story. (laughs) 
I had enough sense to record the thing on audio as well, just to show him exactly what happened. Anyway, the point of that is, is he got set free. And that same week, he went back to everything. And he got into the bondages all again. And his life hasn't changed at all. He had a lot of, he, he, he had a lot of Bible knowledge, but he didn't know a lot of truth. He didn't embrace the truth that was presented to him. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Someone waving their hand over you and casting out a demon can help, but it's not going to help you walk in freedom. Where were we before I went on track? <laughs> How to pray for the lost. So, God loves them more than you love them. That's what we were saying. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. I like this one. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. I want to see what the King James says there. It says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Okay, so let's look at that first part and say, what is it saying? It's saying that the unbeliever is blinded by the God of this world. The devil has blinded the mind of the unbeliever. Why? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, I like how he adds glorious gospel, just to show you, it's a really good message. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he doesn't want them to see and accept the truth. If you're an unbeliever here this evening, we, 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 you're welcome. We love you. But you've got demonic blindness. Now, when I was sharing this in, in, in um, uh, Albania, it was really funny because just before I started sharing this, a Muslim guy walked in. <laughs> it was really entertaining because I, I was basically telling him, you, there's a demonic presence blinding you. And you could see he was getting a little bit uncomfortable, but he didn't understand it because how, how could he? So, there's, a, there's a, a spiritual blindness which prevents them from seeing the glorious gospel of Christ. Why? Because if they see the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, it would set them free. But I like this. Christ is the image of God. So if you see the gospel, the true gospel, you'll see exactly what God is like. Not just Jesus. Because when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? So Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, so there's this demonic blindness. So, so what do you do? You pray. That's one of the first things you can pray for an unbeliever. Not God, please save Auntie Susan. My grandmother's, you know, really ill and she doesn't believe in you. Please save her father. Those prayers won't, hap won't, won't get past your nose. Okay, what you need to do is, is, is pray according to the Bible. And one of the first things is there's a demonic presence, a blindness, so resist it, rebuke it. A good prayer is not, God, please take away the blindness. What do you do? You speak to the mountain. Um, Mark 11, verse 20 to uh, 24 speaks about that. Where it says, you know, if you, Jesus says, have faith in God. If you speak to this mountain and tell it to you know, move from here to there, it will move. What, he's not talking about moving mountains physically. The mountain is your problem. It's the blindness. So what do you do? In the name of Jesus, I command the, 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 the spiritual blindness, the demonic blindness over so-and-so to go. You're using in the name of Jesus, John 14, 14. You, you ask anything on my name and it's done for you. It, and it should work. It will work. Because you're in his authority. You, would, you speak directly to the blindness, you command it to go. For years I prayed for my father, like many others did, that he would be saved. God, please save my dad. You know, God, I really want my dad to be saved. Many of you have had those kind of prayers. Then I realized how to pray properly for an unbeliever. And things started to change. The problem with this kind of prayer, though, is you have to pray it repeatedly. You can't just pray it once and, and trust it works. Praying twice is better because all of a sudden the blindness goes, they see the truth, and if they reject it, the blindness comes back. So whenever you have them on your heart, you pray for them. And you, re you, you reject the blindness, you tell it to go in Jesus' name. So that's the blindness. Then, Matthew 9, 38. Therefore, Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus is saying, hey, pray that send someone. Pray that he'll send someone. So what I would be praying is, Father, please would you send people, Christians, who represent you properly. <laughs> please send them across my Father's path to be able to witness to him. 
to be able to share the true gospel with him, to be able to love him and witness to him. In Jesus' name, amen. And then, I would pray it repeatedly because people would probably come across his path. I wouldn't know about it at the office or wherever. And maybe he rejects it. So I want God to send more laborers. So I pray again. (laughs) And so whenever I had it on my heart, I would pray that. And for many of you, that's the only prayer you can pray for some people. Maybe especially the people that you live with. Because it's a case of you can't minister to them anymore. So now you have to pray for God to send other people to minister to them. That's fine. But you can't use that as a cop-out. You can't go and hide in your prayer closet and just pray for the people that need to be saved. Because 2 Corinthians 5.20, you're an ambassador of Christ. So pray for an opportunity. You need to, 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 to not only wait for an opportunity, but create opportunity. You know, don't, don't just wait for God to, to put like neon lights and, hey, here's your opportunity to witness to so-and-so. It's a, every opportunity that you can make or create or take to go for it. You know, uh, 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 so, so you need to be praying for opportunities. Pray that you'll know when the opportunities will come and then go for it. Even in Colossians 4.3, so Paul asked the believers to pray for him that he would have an opportunity to share the gospel. So we need to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel. Amen? Um, for me, in, in, in my witnessing to my father, that, that I woke up the one morning, got a phone call from my mother saying, you know, he's really ill or whatever the case was. And, and I was like straight away, felt in my heart, it's your time to go. I was living in Stellenbosch, he was living in Durban, but I felt God say, go. I had enough money for a one-way ticket, so I booked that one-way ticket before I even asked for leave, and I went. Because I knew God was saying, go. I went there, I spent a week with him, Monday, Tuesday, and then on the Wednesday, I, really, I woke up that morning, and I, I was uh, having a, some Bible study time, some time with the Lord, and I opened my Bible straight away to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. The end of it says, now is the day of salvation. And I was like, okay, God, I think you're speaking to me. <laughs> now is the day of salvation. It didn't come up normally in conversation. We were sitting there. And I was like, Lord, how do I witness here? Like, I actually don't know what to do. Now, let me say, granted, your father should be witnessing to you. It shouldn't be the other way around. But it's still a privilege to witness to your father. And so I was sitting there going, okay, Lord, now what do I say? And God gave me one question. So you're doing it with the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't have to be weird. All I, all I, the question I thought of was, why did you stop going to church when we were younger? So I asked him the question. He was like, oh, I didn't think of this. Long story short, we spoke through a few religious misconceptions. I, and he was like, oh, I've never heard that before. Great. I shared grace with him. God's not holding your sin against you. It's about re- relationship, not religion. So going to church doesn't make you a Christian as much as sleeping in a garage doesn't make you a car. I shared all that type of stuff with him, pulled all the best lines out, all the best scriptures, and he said, oh, I haven't heard that before. As an ambassador, you need to take the opportunity and present the true gospel. Then what did I do? I said, well, now you've heard the gospel. Bye-bye. You don't leave it hanging like that. You, 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 need, to pre- you need to give the opportunity. So what did I say? Would you, it was difficult to say this. Very difficult. But I said, hey, do you, you want to pray and make sure that you're saved? Who wouldn't want it if you've heard the true gospel? So he was like, yeah, that'll be cool. So we prayed. We cried together. It was genuine. It was awesome. And all I'm, I'm sharing that with you is to show you that if you start approaching it in the, from the right uh, angle, you'll get better results. Okay. You know, and I did all the dragging him to church and all of that type of thing to try and get him to hear you know, the pastor speak so that the pastor can save him. But God wants to minister through us all, not just through the pulpit. We always give an opportunity for people to be born again because it's awesome. But the best testimonies are from you when you go out and reach people and you bring them to church saved. Amen? You know, God, God's made... Getting people saved really easy. And that he's done all the work. All they need to do is accept the gift. And so all we're doing is presenting the gift to them. Sadly, a lot of people don't want to accept the gift because we've, we've gift wrapped it really badly. We've presented it really badly. I said this this morning. You've got this product and you're offering this product. It's a free product to someone. 
If you can't get rid of a free product, then you've got problems, right? <laughs> so we've got this free product and we're like, can I interest you in this free product? It's called eternal life. It's a relationship with God. It's fire insurance for eternity. It's awesome. Do you want it? No. Why? Because the person looks like they're baptized in lemon juice. That's exactly the reason why. They're not smiling. They're not happy. It's like, well, is this Jesus working for you? Because I don't see it working for you. You know, look at your life. Like, let it work for you and then present it. Receive the grace. Let it work in your life and then show people. You know, when, when, and this is maybe a different context, but, but it's the same principle. When I first moved uh, to the Cape from, from, from Durban, um, I, I was listening to Andrew Womack. I, was, I knew had good teaching. I was really fired up and excited. And you know when I got you, you know how many people wanted to hear um, any of the CDs and teachings that I was listening to? Nothing. Not one person I came into contact with. Diddly squat, zero, nothing. No one. No one was interested. People rejected me when I asked them, would you like to listen to these teachings which are changing my life? And I got so fed up of no one wanting to hear even me sharing truth with them personally and not even including where the teaching came from. You know what I did? I stopped. I stopped trying to bash people with the truth that I had. And what I started to do was just, Lord, I'm going to let this change my life. And then people will ask questions. And so I did that. And then it wasn't, it wasn't long and people were like, hey, you know, please could you tell me about healing? Or do you have any good teaching for me to listen to? That was what Marna said to me before we started dating. A good way to find a wife. <laughs> so, you know, what the point is, is that let it work for you and then be a good ambassador because it worked for you. Amen? Last thing I want to share on this is just let, let, let love be your motivation. In 1 Corinthians 13, if you read through it, it says basically if you have not love, it accomplishes nothing, profits nothing. And so for God so loved the world, that's what motivated him to rescue us. Our motivation for rescuing people should be, God's love has changed my life so much, you have to hear this. And then it should be a case, I love you so much, I want to share this with you. You have to know this. And then you just want to go for it. Okay? And, and if you're not in that place of, of wanting to reach out, of wanting to share, it's okay. Romans 8.1 is for you. There's no condemnation for those in Christ. There's no condemnation. God's not holding it against you. The person sitting next to you shouldn't hold it against you. I'm definitely not holding it against you. All it means is, is that you, you need to just sit and receive some more. And let it become an overflow where you'll start to overflow in, in a desire to want to reach out and wanting to be a blessing to people. Could you put up 1, Corinth, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4 again, please? The first scripture, the second scripture that we use. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. So it's not just a few, but it's everyone that you come into contact with and come to the knowledge, unto the knowledge of the truth. So this is God's desires. The more we mature in Christ, the more we grow in our, our relationship with God, His desires should become our desires. That's the thing. The more you come to know God, your heart will change and you'll want what He wants. It's not the other way around. <laughs> he doesn't want what you want. He, you start to want what He wants. And that's when things, your life starts to change and you start to step out with boldness and, and confidence and wanting to reach out to people. You know, I had someone ask me after the morning service, but what about God's timing? Because, I mean, that was one of the things. When I sent messages to the, all of the extended family, excited, you know, my dad just received Christ and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, you know, some of the response was very sovereignty of God orientated, like, well, God's timing is perfect. I was like, no. Present this gospel a few years back, I'm sure we would have a different situation. God's timing, you know what the God's timing is? 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now is the day of salvation. That's God's will. Everyone must get saved now. Is everybody ready for it? No. Why? Because their hearts are hardened. And so for us, we need to be strategic about it. And you present the gospel to them, and they may be like not interested. Don't just leave it there and say they're not interested. You don't decide for them. Let them decide for themselves. And then you say, well, you know, would you like to receive Christ? It's, 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 it's a free gift. They're like, no. You don't just go home then. You say, well, why not? Let's, let's talk about it. Well, you know what? I, I, 
if I get saved, maybe God's going to send me to India. I don't want to live in India. I don't want to be a missionary. Then you can deal with that. Then you can be like, hey, you know, he's not going to do that to you. If, you, if, if, if you're supposed to go move to a foreign country and be a missionary, you'll want to. God doesn't send you where you don't want to go. You know, then you can start to deal with the thing. You know, I don't want to receive this God because he killed my mother. She, she got cancer and God didn't save her. Maybe that's, maybe that's the answer you'll get. You can say, hey, God didn't do that. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said he comes to give a life and life abundantly. The Bible says that by his stripes you were healed. And so, you know, it wasn't God who killed your, your loved one. It, it, it was the enemy. He stole that life. And you just didn't know the right stuff to be able to, to deal with it. But let me show you, give you some good teachings on healing and on your authority in Christ. So you just might have to deal with a few misconceptions in ministering to someone, but hey, minister to them. Because we're all ministers of, of, of Christ. We're all ambassadors for Christ. And so, you know, this is really practical, but I want to encourage you to, to, to take the things we've spoken about and go and, and do it. Step out in boldness. The most exciting thing is seeing someone take that step from darkness to light. I mean, they're not to put bondage on them after that, but show them how they can grow in their relationship with God. It's not just my job. Ephesians 4.11 says it's the, the leadership's role, the fivefold ministry's role, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what's happened today. I've equipped you to go and do the work of the ministry. And if you don't want to do it, then that's fine. There's no condemnation, but focus on God's love for you and it will transform you. Amen. Father, I want to thank you that you love us, no strings attached. I want to thank you that there's no condemnation for any of us if we're not at the place where we are to, to be able to reach out. That we can just, just, just sit and receive and allow you to grow us and transform us to get to the place where we can do that, Father. Pray for every single person in this room that right now we would have an increase in understanding of the true gospel, of your love for us, your grace for us. In fact, Lord, Lord, it's just such a wonderful truth that you're not holding our sin against us. Help that to be our, the message in our hearts which we go and share with people. That, hey, God's not holding anything against anyone. He's forgiven us. All we need to do is receive it. Take it because it's a free gift. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that it's really, really simple. The gospel is simple, it's not complicated. I just feel God just put this on my heart and I need to say, you know, you might go read some Christian books and they're complicated. That's because it's not gospel. The gospel is simple. Some people make it very complicated and you don't need to be complicated. You hang around long enough, you'll see we're very simple here. <laughs> The messages, if they get complicated, then it, it, it tends to go towards legalism and putting effort and works. And that's not God's heart. God's heart is sit, receive, relax. I've done it for you. Just experience my love. I really just feel in my heart that there's some individuals here this evening. You, you know, in, in amongst everything that was shared, the one thing that you got out of it was really just that God's not holding anything against you. And I just, 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 just want to take a moment and say, hey, that's awesome. Forget about everything else I said. And just be refreshed in the fact that God isn't holding your sin against you. Even that sin you're thinking of now, it's done, it's dealt with, it's gone. You know what's even better news than, than the fact that He's not holding it against you? He's never going to bring it up ever again. He's never going to remind you of it. The devil will try, but God will never remind you of what you've done wrong. Hebrews 10 verse 17 says that, that your sin and iniquity, he will remember no more. He's, he's choosing to forget it. He's not choosing to ignore it. He's for, choosing to forget it because Jesus has dealt with it on the cross. You're forgiven. You might not feel innocent, but you should. Because you are innocent. 
The blood of Jesus has washed you white as snow. See, this is what church should be like. You're coming to church and you're being just washed with the water of the word. You're being just, just encouraged and strengthened in the truth of the gospel. Said so you can go out and be strong this week to be able to conquer whatever the enemy in life throws at you. Why go to church and feel condemned? Walk away feeling like you're not doing good enough. God says he's pleased with you because you're in Christ. And he's got good plans for your life. All, if you want to experience those good things, all you need to do is just open up to him and say, Father, I want it. And he'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll show you. He's a good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He'll take you where you need to go. You just need to follow his lead and let him, let him take you there. 